Thank you. And I want to hand it over to our esteemed panel to discuss their wonderful supplement that they have released today. All right. Thank you so much. So it's eight, eight at eight. And we didn't even coordinate that, right? <laughs> so I just want to uh, welcome and thank everyone for joining today's webinar, Community-Centered Approaches to Eliminating HIV, PrEP, PEP and COVID-19 vaccine stigma and discrimination. My name is Dr. Miranda Ward and I'm an assistant professor and director of equity in the Department of Clinical Research and Leadership, which is in the School of Medicine and Health Sciences at the George Washington University. And I'm also the PI of the Gilead funded two in one HIV and COVID screening and testing model. So I'm going to serve as today's moderator given that this webinar is literally kicking off the debut of a set of five scholarly papers and a forward, all about the work of the two-in-one model. And so this really does serve as the inaugural supplement by the HPHR journal, formerly the Harvard Public Health Review, that is issued by the Boston Congress of Public Health. Um, but to just back up a bit, these collections of papers are based on the research and the policy and the training of the two-in-one model. And the two-in-one, is a research informed national capacity building effort for clinicians to eliminate HIV and COVID stigma. How do they do that? Well, we put in a call for them to routinize screening conversations and just make these conversations the standard of care in the primary care setting. So I do wanna shout out the two-in-one core team as well as our national advisory board and all of the partners that have joined us in making our training series come alive. And so, and that's actually who's actually joining us today um, for today's webinar. They actually, the, the three panelists that you uh, see here are actually co-authors on um, the papers, even though we have 14 co-authors, three of them are joining today to really kind of kick off this supplement and just be in conversation about the relevance of the work that we published to medical education, to public health and just advancing health equity. So I'm actually logging in from DC right now the ancestral lands of the Nacotchtuk tribe. And I hope you all take time to recognize the first peoples of the lands that you're currently serving on and training on and aging on. So uh, feel free to add that to the chat. And while you're doing that, I did wanna just take a, a moment to formally thank the official sponsor of today's event, the Boston Congress of Public Health. Thank you so, so much. It was the brainchild of Dr. Cersei LeCompte and Dr. Candace Carpenter to put out a request for proposals for a free open access supplement that aligned with their journal's mission and aim. So I'm equally excited as I am grateful that they selected the two-in-one model for this supplement. It's most certainly an honor. And as you can see, it's pulled up on the screen. Um, and I also wanna make a, a special shout out to uh, Catherine Sacy's as part of the, um, the BCPH team. So what can you expect today? Okay, so today's webinar is actually not gonna be a lecture. It's gonna be instead a moderated discussion. I have prepared some questions and I'm gonna to pose to the panelists who I said, you know, are also the co-authors of the supplement. And um, if you look on the, you know, the Zoom screen, you'll see that there is a Q and A button. And so please don't put your questions in the, um, in the chat, but instead put it in the Q and A and, um, you know, we're going to how basically as the moderator, I'll like check there to see what your questions are. And I actually want to pose your questions in real time. So don't feel like you have to wait until the end to pose your questions because this isn't a formal lecture. I want us to treat this like a fireside chat. <laughs> and um, and then as I check the, you know, the q and I'll pose questions to, you know, whichever panelists or maybe it's a general question that anyone can answer. But uh, we won't be unmuting anyone for verbal questions. So without further ado, I did want to formally introduce my colleagues. So the first panelist is actually someone that I work with at GW. His office is literally right next to mine because we're in the same department. And he actually served as a researcher on the two-in-one team. So um, in this supplement, he was the first author on our policy paper that we entitled Making HIV, PrEP, PEP, and COVID Vaccine Screenings, the Standard of Care in Primary Care Settings. And he was the senior author on our research paper on identifying the factors influencing culturally responsive HIV and PrEP screening for minoritized patients. Um, it was a scoping review and 
that's part of his ballywick. So who am I talking about? Patrick Core. Dr. Core is an assistant professor, like I said, in the Department of Clinical Research and Leadership with me at GW. But he's also the vice program director of integrative medicine and a PI in the Frank Core Research Lab. Um, he actually has experience in designing and leading qualitative and mixed methods health research, and he's currently leading a study on the role of nutrition education in outpatient oncology clinics. He does teach coursework in research methodology, public health, and just general health education, and his research interests, other than health equity, is around subjective well-being, whole body health, and nutrition education. So, welcome, Patrick. So then the, um, the two-in-one model does have a national advisory board, and so these next two panelists served in that capacity as well as co-authors on the screening policy paper in the supplement. So for starters, Dr. Krista Jones, she provided much um, important nursing insight into our national training efforts, and we even got to co-present at a national public health nursing conference that she led. Um, but just so you know, Dr. Jones is a clinical associate professor and director of the University of Illinois Chicago College of Nursing's Urbana campus. She's board certified, uh, advanced public health nurse, and a primary investigator of nursing experts translating the evidence. She serves as the chair of the Council of Public Health Nursing Organizations, president of the Association of Community Health Nursing Educators, and the chair of the Illinois Nursing Workforce Center. She's also a fellow for the American Academy of Nursing and has received grants for her work in nursing. So welcome, Krista. And one of the other National Advisory Board members is actually a resident physician at GW. And we actually go back um, to an anti-racism training that he helped me co-facilitate for his resident cohort. And that just resulted in me wanting to continue working with him. And I'm referring to Dr. Kevin Chung, um, who's a third year resident in internal medicine in GW's internal medicine residency program. But he did study neuroscience at uh, Pomona College and he spent gap years working at a domestic violence shelter and addiction recovery program, and earned his MD at the University of Washington School of Medicine as part of the community-focused Urban Scholars Program cohort. And throughout his medical training, he's been involved in anti-racism and health equity work, and his clinical interests are focused on primary care, addiction medicine, and HIV medicine. So welcome, Kevin. And last but certainly not least is Dr. Philip Alberti, we actually go back to pre-COVID days when I code emailed him to invite him to serve as a moderator for a panel for this health equity summit that I had designed um, and was leading at GW at the time. And so from there, we continued to partner, um, which did include a community data informed national effort to build trustworthiness through a toolkit and other kind of practical resources for the AAMC, which is the Association of American Medical Colleges. So he actually served as a speaker on trust and applying a health justice approach to eliminating stigma and discrimination in our, um, the two-in-one model's nine-part training series. And of course, that was his contribution to the process paper that's in this supplement that we call Building the Capacity of PCPs to Eliminate Stigma Through a Research-Informed Training Model. But just to give some kind of context, uh, Dr. Alberti did earn his PhD in social medical science and his bachelor's degree is in psychology from Columbia. He founded the uh, AAMC Center for Health Justice as a natural next step and a career focused on eliminating inequities in health and healthcare. He also currently serves as the AAMC Senior Director of Health Equity Research and Policy. But before this, he did lead health equity research and evaluation efforts alongside community partners for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and worked as a graduate research assistant with Columbia and the National Center for Children in Poverty. So welcome, Philip. All right, so I'm super excited about this um, opportunity to engage in the conversation with, um, with my colleagues and co-authors. So we're just gonna jump right into that first question. So we all witness science catch up with the spread of COVID, right? So, you know, we have this globally supported mRNA protein that really allowed for the COVID vaccine to come to market at super warp speed. And what that did was it reduced hospitalizations and deaths. And while we have yet to benefit from an HIV vaccine, we can celebrate the science behind PrEP and PEP, which are both FDA approved therapeutics to prevent HIV disease. So the question is, 
do you believe that there have been as many social advancements in HIV and COVID as there have been biomedical advancements? And I'm actually going to ask Dr. Chung if he doesn't mind to kick us off with this uh, discussion, just given his medical expertise. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, since it's August now, just a brief update, I'm now completed my residency training program and I'm now a uh, chief medical resident at GW this year. So <laughs> it's a big transition. Um, yeah, I love this question. So I think it's a complicated question. I do think that like in terms of biomedical advances, obviously there's so much money into research and like pharmaceuticals and like medications and vaccinations and stuff like that. And so there have been like incredible advances especially in HIV, you know, now, nowadays with the medications we have for HIV, people can live life normally without fear of it coming back. Um, as long as you take your medications every day, um, like having taken care of patients in Whitman Walker clinic um, and in my own clinic, um, people can live quote unquote normal lives um, without fear of spreading to other people um, and, um, or just like the stigma too. And so on the social end of things, HIV, I think there have been great advances too, especially hearing from my attendings who have trained in the days of HIV, when HIV was first coming out, like becoming a thing, um, there was incredible stigma, like patients would be shunned, they're almost treated as if like the lepers of that age. Um, and nowadays, um, I think, I think it's regional, but in DC, at least where there is, you know, a very large LGBT community, there's very strong public health presence. Um, I've been actually very surprised at how easy it is to talk about HIV with my patients um, and how my patients who are living with HIV um, like it's just like a normal fact of life as if they have any other medical condition or just like a part of their identity. And it's not anything that's like to be shameful of. I um, mean, that's been amazing to see, but I do know that in other parts of the country, there is a lot of stigma. And I think, I do think that the biomedical advances do outpace the social advances. Although I think we've made great progress when it comes to COVID, I think it's a bit more complicated um, in terms of social progress because it has become a politicized matter too. Um, and in some ways as we regressed um, in terms of public perception of vaccinations for like communicable diseases um, and um, just like perceptions about medicine and healthcare providers and, and hospitals and everything like that um, because of the way that COVID has become like a political bargaining chip um, and it's become more divisive, which has been, you know, having gone through medical school and residency through the COVID era um, it has been very discouraging in a lot of ways. Um, and it's interesting to see how like we as frontline healthcare workers and uh, and witnessing more larger public health institutions like the, as big as CDC to local DC health um, have to like change our med messaging and our approach to patients who like may have um, more altered perceptions of um, the disease and the vaccinations because of this like politicization that happened. I'm glad that you mentioned the importance of messaging because I know like the when we think about the the number of new cases of HIV, like the subgroup that has the highest number of new cases are Black heterosexual women. And that's also the same subpopulation that's least likely to know about PrEP and initiate PrEP. <laughs> so we really have to think about messaging so they feel like, oh, when I see a PrEP campaign or, you know, a poster that it actually is talking to me, right? And I have to think about my own kind of exposures to HIV. So that being said, Dr. Core, Dr. Alberti, please jump in. Given your public health backgrounds and understanding of the social context of infectious disease, share your insights on where we are with the social advances, you know, as we think about the biomedical ones. Sure. So I do agree, uh, Dr. Chung, that, you know, we have made strides forward, right? The landscape of our country is changing, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. Um, but on balance, there have been improvements. I think one thing that I struggle against, both in kind of this world of working with folks um, uh, around COVID vaccines, HIV, both prevention and treatment, but the, I mean, more broadly, right? When I think like lifestyle interventions and, and healthcare and prevention of disease is that in a lot of ways we have, you know, uh, begun leveling the playing field in terms of availability and accessibility of information. People have far more access today to healthcare, the internet, telehealth has kind of really exploded kind of in response to COVID-19. But kind of concurrent with that is this like incredible um, uh, spread of misinformation, which is a remarkable challenge, right? So I can imagine, you know, I don't have a clinical background. I can imagine that acutely clinically that 
impacts the way you're able to engage with patients. But from a public health perspective, you know, not only are we working to undo generations of structural inequity and medical racism, we're now also trying to combat just poor science that's floating out um, uh, like through social media, through internet blogs, all all over the place. Um, so while social advancements are, you know, there has been positive movement, it certainly isn't perfect. And I think we've got um, a pretty substantially heavy lift ahead of us to begin figuring out like, okay, well, we still need to do no more work. We also now need to adapt to this changing information landscape. How do we tackle that as well as some of the um, kind of perpetuated structural problems we've got in front of us? Totally agree. Just to, to tie some of these threads together, you know, uh, Dr. Chung, you mentioned regional variations. Dr. Ward, you mentioned kind of focusing on uh, heterosexual Black women as kind of a subpopulation of, of interest. And I think so much of this conversation truly is hyper local, right? Whether we're defining that local geographically or demographically. So I think about like my own, I guess, the story I'll tell. So I'm, you know, solidly Gen X gay man moved to New York City in the very early 1990s when I think the stat was at that point, 20% of all US cases of HIV were in New York City, right? I remember reading my first Village Voice uh, orientation week and it said something like, statistically one out of every two gay men is HIV positive. So there was this, this kind of fear. And so we were thirsty for these technological advances, these medical advance, ad advances. We were waiting uh, for those trusted relationships and that tech to kick in. And so the story that I'll close with is like, so when monkeypox vaccine came out, was like, oh wait, it, it's painful, it's disfiguring, and I can get it by dancing. Yes, we will take that vaccine, we'll do it immediately. Like there was, that trust had been built, that desire for um, kind of that social support uh, around, around vaccination. I think the points around COVID are exactly right. Like we are not there in some ways because of the misinformation, the disinformation, the hyper politicization, I think we've devolved socially. Uh, and I don't know what would happen if we had like the magical COVID preventive vaccine. I don't know what the uptake would be. And so then to your point, Dr. Ward, the messaging, right, also has to be hyper local and it has to be co-developed. It has to be really through that process of authentic, genuine community engagement to understand the fears, the stigma, the labels applied when stigma is present, right? That's going to vary from street to street, block to block. And so I think it behooves all of our organizations, public health, scientific, medical, to spend time breaking bread, to build those trusted relationships. So when we have a need for messaging, those networks can be activated and we're not scrambling to build a network anew when we should have been doing it all along. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that story, Dr. Alberti. And again, like that's why one of the things we wanted to talk about, the key themes in the supplement and the today's conversation is around stigma. Because, you know, one of the things that um, that kind of came to the fore when we were doing the research with 2 on one and talking with patients was how many of them said that they literally would feel offended if their clinician asked them or offered them to get an HIV test, you know, while they were there doing the clinical exam. And so... You may be wondering, like, well, why would they be offended? Like, HIV testing, you know, saves lives. Well, again, because of the stigma, right? They felt profiled because they know that clinicians are not asking every single patient. So they're wondering, like, well, why, why did you choose to ask me, right? This is why we're making that call to routinize and ask every patient because if we don't do that, then that actually is allowing clinicians to rely on assumptions, you know, made about patients. Like, oh, well, I don't need to ask you because you're married, Right. We know mar like marital status doesn't prevent HIV, right? <laughs> so age bias is also real though, because sometimes, you know, older patients, you know, th they won't ask them about their sexual um, health or post questions about HIV or PrEP. It's kind of like, okay, you know, there's, again, age doesn't protect you from HIV either. So again, instead of relying on these kind of assumptions about who has exposures, just have a set of questions that you ask everyone and depending on their response, that will determine who's a good candidate, right? So that's why we're trying to routinize it the way that we've done with depression screenings, right? So there's no more, it's kind of like, no matter why you came in today, we're going to ask you those set of questions. We, we want to do the same things in a sex positive way. So we think of sexual health as health. So I often share with folks that I, I have yet to even have a PCP offer me an HIV test. Um, and, you know, but the thing is, I know that I do get tested because I actually see my lab core bill. Um, and, you know, it says HIV serology testing. I pull up my patient portal and it has like all of the, you know, lab work that was done. But um, so you might be wondering, well, you know, <laughs> why, why wouldn't your 
clinician kind of bring that up. Well, I do live in D.C., and one of the things that Dr. Arberti was talking about was at a time where there, you know, was a saturation of HIV in New York City. Well, similarly, back in, like, 2007, D.C. had an epidemic, right, of, of HIV. One in 20 adults had, um, you know, had HIV. One That was, you know, basically a one in 100 youth. And so D.C. funneled a lot of resources and into the city. And so now we do have routinized HIV testing in the ED, but also in primary care settings, because we're considered an opt-out state. Well, you know, DC is not a state, but you know. So um, so that basically means that they're gonna automatically test you unless you opt out. And again, I know that's not the case in every single region. So this is why my next question um, is, why do we suppose that screening conversations are just as important as the diagnostic test? So, Dr. Jones, do you mind starting us off with this one? Krista? Oh, my apologies yes. if you just <laughs> called on me. Um, it froze for a second. I was trying to get it to refresh. My sincere apologies. Um, so, uh, I believe you were asking about screening conversations. Is yes. that correct? Yes, that's exactly right. Yes. So I would say, you know, two things here, prevention and control, certainly. Um, screening conversations, they're, they're crucial for us to obtain an accurate depiction of the individual's risk um, in combination with um, the additional residents' um, population and community at risk. So we kind of do those things in combination, both from an individual level and a population health level. Um, but the serology only provides a point in time testing for us, whereas the screening conversations allow us to understand patterns of behavior, um, what increases risk, what decreases risk to the individual, thereby we can allow um, us to provide um, additional treatment plans to mitigate these risks to the individual, their partners and the community by providing essential services and support while controlling uh, future diseases um, spread of that particular contagion. So additional concerns are that uh, many providers choose to recommend testing, as you were just talking about, for known higher risk groups, such as men having sex with men or substance abuse users or uh, sex workers. However, we know the highest increases, as you were just talking about, um, are occurring in Black heterosexual women um, who also have the lowest risk of testing and screening because of that messaging problem, right? So it is um, something that we have to provide concerted efforts into addressing the social determinants. What are the barriers and the challenges experienced by these populations that are preventing them from accessing this treatment? Thank you so much for that, especially, you know, given that kind of role and um, perspective as a clinician. So actually, let me ask Dr. Chung, um, when you think about, you know what, yet another, you know, thing you have to talk about <laughs> during this 20 minute exam, you know, can you kind of think of, can you kind of share some insights on like a healthcare team approach, right? So instead of always putting the onus on just the clinician to lead these screening conversations, um, or maybe you can even share some of the kind of promising practices that you use right now. Um, you know, what does that look like? Or, you know, again, why would it be really important to really make sure that those, converse, those screening conversations are happening in tandem with the diagnostic testing? Great question. I love that question. Um, yeah, there's so much, I mean, there's studies showing that if a PCT is to um, like satisfy every single USPSTF task force um, recommendation for like health maintenance um, per patient, they would have to work over 24 hours a day, every day of the week. Um, and so there's just far too much to do um, in, in medicine, not, a, not enough healthcare providers. Um, but I think, you know, our, for example, our clinic at, the, at GW, um, we do like, um, we use a team approach for healthcare maintenance. For example, our when patients are being roomed, our MAs do the depression screening, um, and and if it's positive, then we take on the more deeper conversation. Um, we have a nurse coordinator who is whose job is to help um, fill in the gaps of colon cancer screening. And outside of our clinical time, like in the visit, we'll be calling patients and helping them get like, connected to the colonoscopies and things like that. Um, and when it comes to more, but when it comes to more like sensitive, like potentially sensitive subjects like HIV testing and screening conversations. I like to take ownership of those things. I think it's important, a part of me building trust with my patient. And also there's clinical decision making in terms of does this patient qualify for PrEP or does this, should this patient be screened more than just once in their lifetime because um, they're higher risk, maybe they, they deserve annual screening. And, and if we just, if we were just testing one time as, as the recommendations might say, and not assessing for risk factors and having a conversation, 
we may be missing patients um, uh, who need more frequent screening and may end up, you know, at risk of getting HIV. Um, and that's the last thing we want. Um, and so I think there's a really great way that we divvy up things that are, um, and, and that are best done by like the nursing team or the MA and things that should be on um, like the medical provider's um, responsibility. If I could add to that, Dr. Chung makes an excellent point there. I think one of the things that we fail to do is we fail to prepare our providers to have mm -hmm. these crucial conversations. From an academic perspective, we need to provide service learning opportunities and simulations for students to have these conversations, to be comfortable having these conversations, to be comfortable asking every person, do you need an HIV test, as Dr. Ward stated previously, right? And so I don't know that we're doing enough of that currently um, in our educational um, offerings to students as we're preparing them to be practitioners. And one thing I'll quickly throw out here too is we've discussed an awful lot particularly in our work reviewing existing policy guidelines for uh, practitioners who are going to be having these screening conversations or providing testing uh, right normalizing testing is really critical incorporating far more frequent uh, discussions annually ideally during a regular checkup is the way to go it, it builds trust it can help debunk myths it makes folks a lot more comfortable talking about um, conditions that have been so long stigmatized uh, and that's something in terms of the work the two-in-one model is done uh, around kind of policy recommendations recommendations for practice change we've really stressed is how do we incorporate culturally responsive communication which is um something Dr. Ward can speak really, really well to, but do that regularly. How do we make that more than just once every couple of years when we think to, or when it comes up kind of organically? All right. So um, I saw that there was a, a request for me to increase the volume of my mic. So let me know if you can hear me. Thank you for noting that also. Um, so we do have a question um, that just came in about structural and policy level interventions. I love that question. Thank you so much for that. And that's actually a question that I'm gonna pose. So Justin, hold on because we're gonna to get to those uh, structural interventions in just a moment. Um, so as we're kind of talking about this idea of testing and the kind of uh, routinizing um, these kind of screening conversations, if you think about it, just imagine, you know, you are tested for HIV and you didn't know you were tested, right? And now there's a positive result. And now the you know clinician or healthcare team has to come back and inform you that you have a positive test or you know on a test that you didn't know you were taking. So that's like places clinicians and healthcare team in this kind of precarious position. So you know we really want to kind of think about you know like Dr. Chung and um, Dr. Jones said this kind of healthcare team approach. You know during um, you know and after the kind of clinical exam. But this also brings us to the importance of patients' rights. So oftentimes we talk about the, you know, informed consent, but we also have to recognize that even though of course all of us are advocating for HIV testing, annual HIV testing specifically, if you're of sexually active, patients do have the right to refusal. <laughs> so this is why we should really have those transparent and honest discussions on a patient's rights. And that's really important, you know, and saying like, okay, you know, here's a panel of tests that we're going to run today. Like, you know, and then they can say, oh, but not that one. Or, you know what, tell me more. Why would I need that? Like, again, it's just a missed opportunity there. So that said, Dr. Arberti, I'm going to um, ask you to start with this one. You know, it, it's, us talking about patients' rights and being, you know, honest and transparent about all the testing that's being had. Um, I want you to weigh in on the, the role that you believe that trust and health literacy really play in preventing HIV in, in this COVID era that we're still in, amongst other in, um, emergent infections like RSV and MPOX. Uh, thanks, Miranda. So yeah, we, we do a lot of work on not, not trust necessarily in our center, but we really try to flip the script and talk about trustworthiness, right? What does it mean for organizations with power and privilege healthcare organizations, academic organizations, public health organizations, to demonstrate they are worthy uh, of community trust. And this work was born from you know, early in the COVID pandemic, 
February, March of 2020, we heard a lot of expert voices from clinicians and scientists and, and public health experts talking about what the community would need around vaccines, right? If only the community were educated, right? They would say, if only they were educated, we had this beautiful, magical pamphlet with all the right local pictures and all the right local jargon, we could just put that pamphlet into the world and demonstrate, they would get, the community would understand that we're not like that anymore, right? We're not like Havasupai, we're not like Guatemala syphilis study, we're not like Tuskegee or Henrietta Lacks, like we're different now. And, and we in the center thought that was just wrong and counterproductive and really ahistorical. And at the time had come for us, whether you are an individual practitioner or an organization, to demonstrate that you're worthy of trust. And I think you, you hit on one of those core themes. You work with seven communities you know, across the nation to really develop what those elements of trustworthiness are, right? So the kind of authentic community engagement and relationship building that I was alluding to earlier are opportunities to demonstrate respect and taking responsibility and transparency like you were just talking about vis-a-vis -vis patient rights, Miranda, um, and, you know, a commitment to this work and authenticity. So I think um, when it comes to how we can engender and begin to have those conversations at the individual practitioner level and that competency and that education that Dr. Jones is talking about, our organizations also need to have their own set of competencies. Right. How do we incentivize the creation and maintenance of real you know, community relationships when there's not a grant at play or a service learning opportunity? How do we make sure that's embedded in job descriptions and accountability structures for the C-suite? How do we you know, create time and space to have those authentic conversations in a clinical setting? And if our organizations aren't built that way, that's simply not going to happen. And, and I think even to take it up to the highest level, and then I'll be quiet, this kind of trustworthiness and authentic engagement, that is what coheres movements for health justice. You know, and to the question that I know we're getting to in the chat, health justice is a policy conversation, right? It is not a, a doctor-patient conversation. It is a system and structure conversation. And all of that is predicated on trustworthiness. Yeah, I appreciate that kind of uh, shift of the, of the, our unit of analysis, right? Because we often just focus on individual patients. Do they trust us or not, right? <laughs> and why they don't. And then that's where kind of terms of vac vaccine hesitancy kind of came in because literally it's, you know, kind of laying blame on patients for why they don't trust the healthcare system and things like that. So it's kind of like, no, 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 let's be very clear from a structural, you know, these are structural in um, inequities. So we need to, you know, policy-based structural intervention. So absolutely, are we worthy of their trust? Love it, right? So we really should, you know, shift that, that you know, that language uh, to really kind of focus on trustworthiness. And I see that you have, um, you have a, a you have some cheerleaders in the in the chat, Dr. Alberti said, never be quiet. We need your voice. <laughs> okay, love that. So um, what about some of our other, um, you know, panelists? So like Dr. Kaur or Dr. Uh, Chung, would you like to weigh in? on that trustworthiness or feel free to actually pivot and really kind of talk about health literacy because you know, part of the nation's health goals, Healthy People 2030, um, is to not just eliminate health disparities and achieve health equity where everyone has a spare opportunity to, you know, uh, achieve what's possible for them, um, but also to attain health literacy. And this actually kind of circles back to what Dr. Corr was talking about earlier in this kind of disinformation <laughs> era that we're living in. And, you know, we're just so inundated with so much information it's at our fingertips. How do we kind of sort through and make sense of it all and what's credible, right? So if we really kind of think about health literacy and the role that plays in misinformation, stigma, and or, you know, one of the, like we said, doing a paradigm shift, how that actually can, you know, allow for you to be um, engaging in health seeking behaviors. So Dr. Kaur or Dr. Chang, do you have any thoughts on the, the importance of health literacy in that regard? Sure. Well, and so I think really kind of quickly, I agree with you, Dr. Alberti, that this is a huge problem and it needs to be structurally addressed in nature. And when we look at something that's like, if we look at this from a, um, a kind of a systems theory approach of things, it's a wicked problem. We know that there isn't a single solution, that there isn't a single change the education system and we're going to address all issues of health literacy. We know there's no change medical education and suddenly we're going to be producing uh, perfectly culturally humble practitioners every single year we have great, right? That, that isn't, happening. Our country is far too big, far too diverse, far too divided, and far too complex. There needs to be, I think, kind of a multifactorial approach, both 
like locally, acutely in a clinical setting, we need to have practitioners who are willing to talk to patients, discuss what they understand, what perceptions they have and challenge those perceptions. We need to work with medical schools so that they're in nursing schools and PA programs and occupational therapy programs, like clinical programs, such that they're providing an education that prefer- prepares our practitioners to be curious, respectful, responsive, willing to do some of the work to understand the patients that they serve and the priorities that they they kind of bring to their space. Um, in my mind, you know, it's a policy level issue, but it's also an individual issue. And we, with the two-in-one program, have really taken this broad look at, well, what do our practice guidelines say? And then we've hammered down to say, okay, well, locally, what are our primary care practitioners telling us? What are they seeing? What are they needing? What are concerns that they butt up against? Um, So in, in my mind, we need to really be thinking expansively about this issue and how we tackle it. Thanks for that. I love the emphasis on like the structural changes that need to happen. You know, as someone who's uh, from like taking care of patients like at the bedside or in my office, um, like on that level, like it's so for me, it's it's of the utmost importance to make sure that the way I'm communicating is a way that's understandable. I've definitely like observed patient encounters where I knew like that my attending or whoever I was with was the way they were talking was just a complete medical jargon and even I can barely follow, you know, and how is this patient who's, you know, not even been able to complete high school, um, like, and understand what you're saying. Um, and so for me, like being able to interpret, it's, I think it's a lot of the like healthcare provider's job to interpret a lot of the information out there for the patient in a way that they can understand. Um, and for me, that's spending time, like thinking intentionally about how do I explain diabetes or how do I explain the COVID vaccine in a way that is understandable to the lay person. Um, and I do think that medical schools, um, at least in my experience, are starting to see this as important and and like helping us practice that. But I think there still needs to be a lot of work done in that space. Um, I do think there's actually like a space for like, AI for this thing, actually, because I, I, I've definitely even like put in like a patient education and said, like, please, like, like rewrite this in a fifth grade reading level or a 10th grade reading level. And that helps me learn like what language to use and also helps like it makes it a little bit easier too, um, to off of some of that work, but um, I think that's one way for especially people who struggle a bit more with that kind of translation in a way, um, that might be a helpful tool. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Doc. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Jones, go ahead. Yeah, if I may jump in, I was just gonna say, it's most basic level. Health literacy is, it's a key social determinant of health and it's directly correlated to a person's health status, right? So if you don't understand anything about prevention or your disease or your present health status, condition, treatments, then you're going to have poorer health outcomes, right? And so it behooves all of us to make sure when we're having these conversations, as Dr. Chung um, previously stated, that we're asking questions and that we're not taking nods for understanding you know, which so happens um, in a lot of our fields, you know, we have 15 minutes to see a patient. So, you know, it's a quick in and out and we don't take the time to thoroughly understand or to thoroughly comprehend whether or not the patient understands the guidance that we're providing. And we give, we print out these sheets and we hand it to them and we say, okay, read this, but we're making assumption again, that you know, they speak the same language, that they understand the same information, that their um, learning level is at fifth grade or above, which it may be below and that they can actually read the information that we're giving to them. And so that kind of goes back to the same messaging, you know, when we were talking about that previously. So I just wanted to bring that up because this is why we have so much problem um, currently in uh, many of the locales that we were talking about before that Dr. Alberti was talking about before with this prevention and health poor health statuses. And particularly when we look at PrEP, we see that there's um, lower uptakes of PrEP in racial and ethnic minority populations, rural communities, the Southern region, and we can directly correlate it back to some of these issues. So, you know, there has to be concerted federal effort to putting funding in to addressing health literacy throughout the entire nation. Yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Jones and Dr. Chung. I will say that, you know, um, I'm engaged in some health literacy work um, here in the district. And one of the things that um, that came that comes through in the literature is that even well-educated patients prefer simple, clear information, right? So it's not <laughs> so it's not like, oh, we're just doing this for this. No, across the board, everyone wants simple, clear, 
you know, to understand information. So we should just assume all patients, you know, need this this um, level of of information. And also moving, going back, like we were talking about before, instead of always thinking about at the individual level, does the patient have the understanding? Can they process this? Can they act on this? We're actually moving the pendulum to also include um, organizational health literacy. Because if you think about it, you know, that this health literacy conversation doesn't start when the patient enters the clinical exam room. It started when they opened the door into the, the waiting room. So, you know, you think about navigational access, right? How they got here today, how long it took for them to get an appointment. Like, you know, all of those, this is part of the organizational kind of health literacy and ensuring that there aren't gaps where people are kind of falling through the cracks, the first the person at the front desk, like all of the things. So I I, um, I appreciate us having that conversation and, and us all always kind of zooming back out and looking from a kind of bird's eye view. But I do want to pivot a bit and I want us to kind of really kind of talk about um, racism um, in particular. And so, you know, I know that we collect data on race and that's how we actually know that we have racialized disparities that exist, not just in, you know, COVID and um, and HIV, but just on a range of health outcomes. But I will say that we really do need to stop conflating race with a range of other proxies that we just aren't measuring, but we're calling race. So as an aside, um, I'm actually a part of this research team. We're um, a different research team than the two one. But basically, one of the things that we're doing is we're applying an anti-racist lens to our disparity research on pediatric safety events. And we decided that we're not going to use white children as the reference group for every indicator. And instead, let's use the best performing group. That makes sense, right? <laughs> and so one of the things that we're intentionally refuting is kind of the way that we standardize whiteness. Absolutely. Thinking about, you know, this whiteness becoming the norm. We do it in research. We do it in patient care. So this does get to my question. We do have irrefutable evidence that racism, not race, is what actually produces racialized disparities, just as gender oppression, not gender, produces gender disparities. So why should our efforts, now this gets to the question in the Q&A box by Justin, actually the, the efforts that we have to address health disparities, why should they be structural in nature rather than solely individual risk behavior? I, I will happily jump in. Everything you just said, Dr. Ward, made me want to nerd out so deeply, <laughs> uh, especially kind of not using race as a proxy for racism. And there's a really a lot of great work. Um, maybe we can have another conversation about what's underway on that front. You know, I think first and foremost, as we all know, right, inequities, health inequities, simply don't exist for a person, right? They are exclusively defined at the population health level. And so that tells us exactly where our interventions need to be pitched at populations, not individuals. So if we're serious, you know, social science tells us 15% of what makes a person or a community healthy is related to clinical care, right? So this is a multi-sector effort that is rooted at population level interventions. And so uh, my training uh, back in the day was in the school of thought that there were um, social factors are fundamental causes of disease, right? So my mentors were Lincoln Phelan, if you know who those folks were. And so what are these social factors? This is all the isms, classism, racism, cisgenderism, sexism, you know, you name it, right? And the way that these work as fundamental causes is first of all, they control access to who has or doesn't have these really important health promoting resources like voice, power, money, information, come up so many times today, prestige, right? And they're really clever. You can block off one form of racism and racism will find another pathway to exert its influence. And the reason that it's so important to think about structural interventions that rend the isms, that rend classism, racism from the roots is because those isms work their way into our policies right, into our political determinants of health, like Daniel Dawes would say, right? So when you think about voter restrictions, we can talk about racism. When you talk about bans on gender-affirming medical care, we can talk about cisgenderism. When you talk about work requirements for uh, social benefits, we can talk about classism, right? So you can see these real world examples of the way these fundamental causes determine which communities have opportunity for health and which communities do not have opportunity for health. And you can think about that opportunity as like, uh, um, 
kind of maldistributing across our communities these social determinants of health, these vital conditions like humane housing and lifelong learning and reliable transportation. Those policies informed by the isms determine who has those and who doesn't. So if we are serious, right, we need to build this movement for health justice that is about removing the policies that are based in the isms and implementing new ones that actually create health opportunity for communities, for all communities. Again, the last thing I'll say, and I know I won't say that I'll be quiet, I'll keep talking forever, is that this this is, you know, the, the counter narrative is that this is a, a zero sum game, that we are somehow saying that we're going to Robin Hood health justice. We're going to make community A healthier by stealing health opportunity from community B. That is absolutely not true. We have enough resources to build a movement that would provide health opportunity so that all communities thrive and no community is at the short end of that stick. So, um, yeah, we could talk about policy interventions all day. So thank you for that question, Dr. Ward. Absolutely, Dr. Alberti. Thank you for making very clear that this is not a zero sum game and we do have enough resources to go around. And that's why, you know, not everyone has been in favor of equity because they, they make it seem like, oh, I'm losing something. Um, and when we when we have conversations around equity. But uh, Heather actually posed some questions in the chat. And so I want to make sure that we get to the questions. And so Dr. Chung, do you mind taking the first question from Heather? And she really wants to know if, um, you know, what ways that we can make health communication culturally sensitive and accessible to minoritized uh, communities? I love that. I think, I mean, I think it's been brought up in, in our conversation too, is that like all of this, everything should be based on the like, partnership with the community, right? Like we, as someone who grew up like upper class and Asian American household in the North Pacific Northwest, like I do not, I am not, <laughs> someone who can decide how to communicate like in a culture sensitive way to someone who did not grow up the way I did. Um, and so it's so important to partner with people in the community using the privilege I have and, and the medical education I have and redistributing that in a way and, and partnering in a way to empower people who like have not had the opportunities I have had. Um, and so um, I think that when it comes to like more public health communication, like I, it, it should never be me deciding what the, what the, where the money goes or what to do with, you know, what, what the aim is and stuff like that. I think it's, it's it, that would be very um, egotistical of me. And I think we have a lot of people, a lot of us in who are like in this ivory tower um, in academia and in, and in medicine um, have to become more humble and, and um, see that there's a lot of strength in these communities that we, we that we call underprivileged or underserved or whatever, you know, but they, that we need to, um, we need to redistribute the power that we have in these academic institutions. Um, I think also um, from like a patient provider perspective, um, for me, it's so important to like to not consider racism um, or sexism or whatever ism in my everyday communication and my everyday interaction would be malpractice. I think that you have to you have to consider like those social factors when you take care of your patient, or else you are going to contribute to bias and exacerbate bias and. Um, and health inequities, like we need to, I talk about racism with my patients um, if it's relevant um, and I acknowledge it. And I think that builds both trust and, and they see me as someone who they can talk openly about their experiences. And like, I, for example, um, if I were to like give the road to diet and exercise, um, you know, um, counseling to a patient who um, has diabetes and, and high cholesterol, um, I just, and to every, if I chose a, chose a colorblind approach and just do the same approach for everybody, then my patient who is wealthy and can afford like kale and can go afford a gym membership is going to do a lot better than my patient who lives in a neighborhood where they don't feel safe walking because of gun violence and are in a food desert. Um, and then my patient who is wealthy is going to become more healthy than my patient who has these structural barriers to becoming healthy. Um, and so I need to understand that for me to give good medical advice and to have a good medical conversation about what approach we can use to, to be healthier. Um, and so um, it's like an integral part of patient care. I think that medical schools are doing a better job of acknowledging this and making sure that we use this like structural lens in, in direct patient care. Um, but I do think we have a lot of room to improve. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Dr. Chung. And so Heather, I know you had other questions about resources for health literacy, like, um, ARC, AHRQ, um, a federal um, agency, has lots of resources online around health literacy, including like teach back um, methods so that we cannot do what Dr. Jones was talking about, just relying on nods. It's like, no, actually summarize back <laughs> what we talked about, right? So there's lots of resources in that, in that regard. Um, so we do have four minutes left. And so I'm just going to pose this final question and each of us can just do a round robin, just 
in one sentence, <laughs> how would you respond to this? Okay. Because, you know, we, and then th I think that this is a really good way to end this discussion too, especially given our current, um, you know, social political climate and all of the challenges and threats to funding and the rhetoric around DEI and DEIJ. Um, so why do you believe that it remains important for clinicians to intentionally consider and translate their values for diversity, equity, inclusion, justice into clinical practice. So let's go ahead and start with Dr. Kaur. Oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> One sentence, right? No, no pressure. Big and important question. Okay. Yes. Um, I think it's necessary that we do that because it's impossible to make change without it. If we're not being self-reflective, self-critical, we're not going to be serving our communities well. Absolutely. Well said. Dr. Alberti? Uh, because we all want to feel safe and heard uh, when we go to a doctor's office. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Jones? Yeah, I would say the same thing, because if we want to make a difference, if we want to improve the health status of the populations that we serve, we have to understand their communities, their cultures. We have to be engaged in those communities. I mean, that's actually going to religious centers and going to community health centers and being out in the community with these individuals, going to conferences, webinars, panels, discussions, service learnings, we have to really engage and understand their cultures and embrace them and improve and, and make that part of the treatment plans to empower them to improve their health status. Absolutely. And last but not least, Dr. Chung, you can go ahead and take us out. That last I think on that on that note, for like advice to like our medical future medical providers or healthcare workers, like be curious about your patient and try to see them more than just what they step in the door with. Like who, who are they, where they come from, why are they the way they are? Absolutely. Thank you. So we're at the point now where you should see in the chat that we um are sharing the official homepage of the supplement. Read it, share it, cite it. For those who are faculty like me, make it required reading for your students. Um, this does bring us to the end of the program. We certainly thank you for your time and we hope to stay connected with you online. So Dr. Cersei, did you wanna say anything to close out the discussion today? Yes, I just wanted to um, thank you to the GW team for this amazing supplement. We are so honored to publish um, this incredible scholarship. And what a pleasure this session was this morning. What a great way to start a Thursday. Um, if you do wish to um, be sure to read this, you cannot miss this academic um, rigor. It's at bcphr.org slash edition um, 89 HPHR supplement. We put the link in the chat. Um, it's also available in all the mailers that we sent out. Um, and if you go to bcphr.org, it's directly there on the home page. If your organization is interested in producing a supplement with us, you know, be sure to reach out to us um, at bcph.org. Um, but again, thank you so much um, to Dr. Ward and her incredible team, Dr. Kaur, Dr. Jones, Dr. Alberti, and Dr. Chung um, again wonderful morning. And um, if you haven't checked out our elite membership for bcph.org, which supports researchers um, like yourself, um, please do bcph.org slash elite. And I think we have reached the end of our webinar. Um, I'd like to ask my colleague, Dr. Carpenter, if she had any final words. I'm all set. Thank you all so much for an excellent webinar. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Enjoy your day.